Let us turn now to the actress Fran Drescher. She's best known for playing the iconic Fran Fine in the 90s hit sitcom The Nanny. Now she's back on our TV screens with the new comedy show Indebted, about two parents who move in with their son after blowing their life savings. Along with her comedy career, Drescher focuses her time on non-profit organization called Cancer Schmancer, which was founded in 2007 after she herself was diagnosed with uterine cancer. She talks to our our contributor Anna Cabrera about advocating for health care and about her own harrowing sexual assault. Let's start with this new primetime show of yours, Indebted. Indebted. Tell us about it. Well, you know, it's a charming show about a loving family. Baby boomer couple goes bust and has to move in with their millennial son and his young family. And you're so, the baby boomer mom. Yes, of course. And so that's kind of the premise of the show. And it's a little bit of a role reversal because the parents are a little more of the adolescent and the uh, son is more of the parent. So it's who's the parent and who's the kid. And uh, it's, I think, a very interesting way to show the typical middle-aged couple, the parent and grandparent, the matriarch of the family, is, um, you know, very loving but very immature. And uh, and there's three generations that you yes, to, to wears take a great look at. clothes, lo loves spending money, loves giving away money to a fault. <laughs> Um, well, we have a clip, so hold okay. your thought, and we'll discuss on the other side. Okay, great. Let's, let's show it. I can't believe all this time you've had no money. Yeah, you should have just told us the truth. Uh, remember how you lied to us about being gay for so long? You mean when I was in the closet? Yes. Now, why didn't you just tell us? Because I was uncomfortable and scared and confused. Exactly, like us. And so now, we're coming out as broke. <laughs> We're here, we're broke, get used to it. <laughs> this is not the same situation. A everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna downsize and sell the house before we lose it. Yeah, we're hoping Davey will renovate our house as beautifully as he did yours, and then we can sell it for double. You're insanely talented. Everyone's talking about it. <laughs> Do you have as much fun playing that character as it looks like? <laughs> I do. I really enjoy it. I love playing immature people. I love playing lighthearted, loving people. I really, we laugh all the time on the set, and we're in gratitude that we have a job where we can be so, you know, uh, have so much fun. With a show like Indebted, is the goal just to make people laugh, to sort of be cathartic and escape from reality, or is it really to help people reflect on their own realities and their relationships and family dynamics? Well, in all of the shows that I ever uh, produced, like The Nanny, I always like to have a global message. And the global message of The Nanny was, it doesn't matter what you look like or what you sound like, it's what's in your heart that counts. And every episode had to somehow speak to that global message. And when uh, we did uh, Happily Divorced, that global message was that everybody has a right to live an authentic life. And so every episode kind of spoke to that. Even subtly, it gives you a goalpost of, you know, what you're writing towards. Um, in this show, because I'm not the writer or creator of it, which I haven't actually done that in over a quarter of a century, so it's a little bit of a of a new experience and, and frankly, a little bit challenging because obviously I have my own ideas and opinions mm -hmm. about things, but I do try and talk to my writer producers and uh, get them to uh, ground it in some kind of real feelings and emotions. And I think that it's important uh, because when you're sitting at home, I love to make people laugh. I think that it's really medicinal. I want people to have an escape. I think that television is visual eye candy, and we have to satisfy that on every different level. But then on some, you know, there has to be a little bit of depth. And for me, this is a family that is learning to live together. And with every time that we try and build ourselves up so that we can move out and get back to our own independent lives and fail, or the hope of that begins to fade, we're back to 
once again trying to figure out how we're all going to live together. You're obviously still the nanny we all fell in love with in the 90s, and I understand there may be the nanny coming to Broadway? Yes, the nanny musical. And I'm so relieved that I have an opportunity now to talk about it in a limited way, but, you know, we've been sort of keeping it a secret for a while until we close deals with our music team and our director and our lead producers. And so Peter and I are really thrilled to see this new kind of manifestation of the series. You have such a unique voice, right? May I see your resume, please? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Crayon? Lipstick. Of course. And what a lovely shade. <laughs> and that's part of what makes you stand out. It makes you so memorable. Did you always embrace it? Well, when I was first starting out in the business, I was advised to uh, try and correct my speech so that I could play more of a variety of roles. And I actually did take some lessons to learn how to speak differently, but then I kind of lost my sense of humor. Mm. And at some point, I just made peace with the fact that I'll be playing different people in different life situations that all are funneled through this, you know, big persona that is Fran Drescher. And that's okay with me. I, I really, more than having uh, diverse characters, I would rather diversify my talents by being a writer, a producer, a director. You mentioned that you and Peter are working on this production of The Nanny for Broadway. Peter Mark Jacobson was your first husband. You were married for about 20 years. Yeah. And at the time, while you were married, you were co-creators and co-writers of The Nanny, which right. was obviously such a hit. What was that like, being married to your co-creator, your business partner? What was that like? Well, you know, I think that, I don't know what it would really be like today. But then I think we both didn't know ourselves as well and uh, needed to figure things out. I, I wouldn't recommend it, really, because um, it consumed our lives. And we had to kind of try and make rules not to always be talking about the show mm -hmm. if, it, we was in, if we were in bed, if we were eating. You know, it's like we just took the show with us through every facet of our life. And that became too all-consuming and, I think, unhealthy for the relationship. But, um, you know, there were other things. I think that because we had met when we were 15 and became very uh, codependent, rather than experience independence at that tender age when you're supposed to be backpacking through Europe, mm -hmm. going away to college, uh, learning who you are, dating different people. Uh, we never did that. We met when we were 15. We became best friends. We fell in love. We became high school sweethearts. And that was basically it. By 21, we were already married. So, um, as romantic a notion as marrying your high school sweetheart may be, uh, you know, I really wouldn't recommend that either, mm. unless you take that break to figure out who you are. So when you come together, you understand that, you know, you need to make room for the other person to blossom. You need yeah. to give the other person space to grow. And we really didn't understand that at all. I very easily can become very absorbed in um, the man I love's energy. Hmm. And I see this with my parents. My mom is very, very nurturing as, and, and uh, to my dad and takes very good care of him. Um, but almost to a fault. I don't think she takes care of herself as mm. well as she takes care of him. And I'm always the one that's trying to get her to realize that that's not in her best interest. But she's a 50s gal. She cooks, he eats. You know, it's kind of that simple. That wasn't simple. necessarily what was going that on, though, for you and your relationship, right? I was right? becoming a big star, and I had a big appetite for travel, for culture. Uh, I wanted to learn art collecting. I wanted to get involved in politics. I, I wanted to do a lot of things. I wanted to meet interesting people. And um, I think that Peter was a little threatened by all that if it didn't include him. 
it, he didn't really give me uh, a lot of room to grow on my own, separate and apart from him. And uh, later on, years later, because now I very affectionately regard him as my gay ex-husband, mm -hmm. that he had realized that he was trying to control his true orientation, and that kind of spilled over into controlling me as well. And that became a little bit suffocating for me, which ultimately, you know, made me realize that I, I have to get out to find who I am because he won't let me do it within the relationship. And it was after you divorced that he came out as gay, as I understand it, right? Yes. During, How did that come during about? During the relationship, he went into therapy because, um, I, you know, we had been victims of a violent crime, him, me, and my girlfriend, one night. And it was a very ill-fated night. You've uh, spoken publicly about this. Yes, you and were I've written about it, too. At gunpoint. Yes. With the home invasion from, situation. By a man we didn't know and his brother. And the, he was on parole. So, you know, it's, it's very disheartening to think that he was incarcerated and then he was let go. Oh. And then he went on a rampage. And I was, you know, not the only woman that uh, he had raped. Oh, when my girlfriend was there and she was raped, too, while Peter was tied up and blindfolded. But um, uh, I ended up, because I have a photographic memory, helping the police do the, the artist's sketch of what he looked like. And uh, based off of that, they were able to apprehend him. And um, uh, I have at least the closure, which a lot of women sadly do not have, but I do, that, you know, he's locked away now for good and will never do that again. And, and I don't have to, you know, think I see him every time I turn a, cor a corner. I can only imagine sort of the lasting pain that that causes for somebody to be assaulted in such a violent way. I know it took you 10 years to publicly speak about what happened, right? Why did it take so long? Uh, well, I, I think what happened was I, I had written about it um, in the book Enter Whining. I wasn't really famous. It wasn't like anybody was that interested in what was going on in the life and times of Fran Drescher. Not until The Nanny. When I did The Nanny, I wrote what became the New York Times bestseller, Enter Whining. In that book, I wrote a chapter called Bad Things Happen to Good People. And I cannot tell you how many women have asked me to sign that chapter, because it means a lot to them that somebody like me uh, could show that, you know, life can go on, you can somehow put yourself back together, and create a new normal. You're, you're never the same person that you were before that experience. But, um, you know, I mean, it informs every aspect of mm -hmm. my life and, uh, and always will. But um, it, it, talking about it, turning your pain into purpose is very healing and helps to, you know, help other people, too. And, you know, the things that happened to me, I, I feel like I, I'm, I feel an obligation to talk about it publicly because I feel like I got famous first. And uh, then, you know, had a, um, a, a platform mm. to uh, influence other people uh, for the greater good. You are also a cancer survivor. As I understand it, it took eight doctors and two years yes. to determine that Get you had uterine diagnosis. cancer? Yeah, I was misdiagnosed um, because I was actually too young and too thin for the average woman who gets uterine cancer. But 25 percent or one in four of us are young and thin. So it seems to me that, you know, uh, doctor number one, who said I was too young for an endometrial biopsy, should have just given it to me. It's a simple two-minute test that she could have done in her office. But doctors tend to be bludgeoned by big business health insurance to go the least expensive route of diagnostic testing. And many of them subscribe to the philosophy, if you hear hooves galloping, 
don't look for zebra, it's probably a horse. So for all intents and purposes, it seemed like I was perimenopausal because I was kind of at the right age for that. But truth be told, um, I wasn't. I had cancer and I was being mistreated for a perimenopausal condition that I didn't have. And I started to realize that um, there are many um, grave illnesses that at the earliest, most curable stage, what I call the whisper stage, um, mimics far more benign illnesses. So if you happen to be dealing with a doctor who isn't trying to rule out the zebra because they're so convinced it's got to be a horse, then you're going to slip through the cracks. And I was lucky because even after two years and eight doctors, I was still in stage one mm. because uterine cancer happens to be very slow growing. I always say to people, save your Christmas club account for uh, tests that insurance won't pay for because the best gift you can give your friends and family is a long and healthy life. And I know that that's the mission of your Cancer Schmancer Foundation is to help raise awareness. And you see, this. there was immediately after the cancer silver lining started to kick in because I was still in this mode after the rape that I had to be the strong one and not really give in to my pain. I, it was hard for me even to share it with my, fa my parents. I had to have my sister tell them because I never wanted to cause them stress. It was so hard for me to tell them. I had her tell them. And then over the years between the rape and the cancer, and frankly, I think, Part of the cancer was because I held in the pain from the rape. So it's almost poetic that I should get a gynecologic cancer yeah. of all of all things. But um, by the time I had the cancer, I had already been in therapy, very serious right. therapy. And I decided that should anything bad ever happen to me again, I'm going to handle it completely different. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to ask people for help. I'm going to pick up that phone and have the courage to call my parents, no matter how heartbreaking it's going to be for it's them. It's okay to be vulnerable, I'm not going to pick up cigarettes again. I did that after the rape. I had quit smoking. That night, I started smoking again. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm hurting myself even more and using it as an excuse. But over the course of those, you know, 10 years, I had really grown a lot as a human being. And so the cancer was my opportunity to ask for help. It was my opportunity to learn how to become a more well-rounded woman, to be more inclusive, to say to somebody, you know, I need help. I, yeah. I need you to carry me. I can't do this alone. I never was able to say that, ever. And I think so many women feel that way. You have to carry it all on your shoulders. You don't want to come across as weak. So you're giving everybody out there permission. Thank you for being very authentic and real <laughs> with us. My pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk with you, Fran Drescher. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.